for those of us who don't have deep ties, deep, deep family ties to Beirut and Lebanon, my family's Kesabsi, it's a place and a people that we recognize as a bright beacon of 20th century Armenian life. But today there's a sense of being tired of what has become a myth and anger that the Phoenix is being asked, asked to rise one more time. The Phoenix, Phoenix itself represents a process of magical thinking, something that just happens if we hope hard enough. But just as Lebanon's collapse is caused by real humans, so does it, its rebuilding require not just dedicated individuals, but people working together, leaders working for the people. We know that change doesn't come without hard work, without demands, without protests. And we see this around the world today in varied but connected forms of incompetence, moral and financial corruption, and of course, criminal negligence. This evening, we've brought together people whom we admire and from whom we want to learn more about how Lebanon might move forward into a space of social justice, equality, and safety. Tatiana Der Avadisyan is our moderator tonight, and she will introduce the panelists. Tatiana herself is an Armenian Institute trustee. She's also part of the Economist Group as business development manager. She's completing her executive education in public leadership at the Harvard Kennedy School, and is the London ambassador for their women's network. In addition to her work with the Armenian Institute, Tatiana also serves as a trustee and vice president for Alcyonidis UK. Tatiana, I'm going to turn over to you now and to our panelists, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Susan. Um, and thank you, everyone, for coming and joining us this evening. Well, uh, to kick off, I mean, where do we start from? Following on from Susan, um, you know, here's a brief overview of Lebanon for, I'm sure everybody knows, but for those that don't, I mean, Lebanon has a population of over 6.8 million. It is one of the most diverse countries in the Middle East with over 18 officially recognized religious communities. Depending on which data you subscribe to, about 60,000 of those are of Armenian descent. It is said Armenians um, made up 12% of that population before the civil war. Lebanon has a unique government structure, which was created to keep conflict between the communities at bay. Although the system is working, the internal fixtures seem to be broken and there doesn't seem to be a will by the powers that be to change things. Before the devastating and preventable explosion on the 4th of August, AI was discussing a new series of events exploring Armenian diaspora communities around the world. Lebanon was high on that, on that list, given its deep-rooted connections for many Armenians, and we even started a discussion with Sarin, one of our future pa featured panelists, about the areas of focus for Lebanon. For example, the refugee crisis or the mass exodus of the youth population and how to address it. These are not uncommon challenges, as many countries are facing these issues, but add broken and failed institutions, deep-rooted corruption, constant insecurity, and you might begin to understand the Lebanese desperation. Then the explosion rocked the city of Beirut, reverberating across the country, among its diaspora, and all those with a connection or affinity to Lebanon, catapulting and expediating the need for change now. It brought back old traumas which, had, which have never quite healed. In the beginning, everyone thought that the country was being attacked and the real story unfolded. It turned out to be human folly and criminal negligence was to blame. Those who should be trusted because they have been left with the burden or honor, depending on how you see it, of responsibility to protect its population failed them again. How much more tragedy and trauma can be borne by the people? How many times can people rebuild, walk on eggshells waiting for the next calamity? At what cost to society, its culture, and the land they treasure so much? Tonight we ask four young Lebanese activists who sh to share their thoughts on the present and future fate of Lebanon. I'd like to briefly introduce each speaker. Um, we've got Shahin Arbolian, a 21-year-old political science, uh, science international relations graduate student of the Lebanese American University. He's now working towards his MA in multimedia journalism as a graduate program scholar there. Um, and he previously worked for HIPEM, the Hamas Gain Armenian culture pla cultural platform as their management assistant and social media manager. 
He has um, he recently volunteered with the NGO Norlus Luis of Gumri, Armenia, and his interests revolve around language migration as well as labor and social movements. Our second panelist is Shushan Keshishian, who recently received an MA in post-war recovery studies from the University of York, where she was an Al Tajir scholar after studying political science at the Lebanese American University. She is founder of the Beirut Recovery Resource Guide, created a few days after the explosion to respond to the needs of victims and volunteers. Currently, Shushan is based in Armenia, working as a specialist at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Her interests include peace building, conflict transformation, and sustainable development. Our third speaker is Mike Ayvazian, who holds a BA and Masters in Theatre Studies. He later studied expressive arts therapy and social change, psychodrama, and clay field therapy around Europe and the Mediterranean. A professional in the field since 2010, he also trains individuals and businesses. He teaches acting and cultural subjects in schools and um, is the co-founder of Asarte Association de Thérapie par les Arts Expressives, an NGO committed to social change. Our fourth and final panelist is Salim Karajerjian. She has an MA in Environmental Policy Planning and currently works for the Islam Affairs Institute for Public Policy and International Affairs at the American University of Beirut as a Special Projects and Grants Manager. She is the former coordinator and founder of the AGBU Young Professionals in Lebanon, and she founded the Rotaract Club of Sahel Met in 2001 and co-managed a national tobacco-free campaign. Sarin has written articles on women refugees in Burj Hamoud in Syria deeply and on trauma and exile of Syrian refugee women in Lebanon. Thank you for all of you for choosing to participate in this very important discussion. I'd like to kick it off by asking you each to tell me a little bit, tell us a little bit about yourselves. What have you been doing to support those most affected by the destruction of the explosion? Um, Sarin, would you like to start? Um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for organizing uh, this panel and uh, and thank you for joining us as well from all over the world. Um, first of all, uh, I mean, like Tatiana mentioned, uh, this is my background. Uh, following the explosion, um, well, we were at shock at first when we heard the explosion, our whole building and whole body moved and uh, because of the intensity and the sound of it. I mean, this is the third uh, largest uh, non-nuclear uh, explosion in the history. Um, so it's quite uh, shocking and even up until to date, 30 days and um, nine days, I mean, 30, one month and nine days later, we are still in shock of, uh, of this intensity. Shahan. Hello, everyone, and thank you for the Union Institute for organizing this uh, timely panel. Um, aside from the introduction that was given by uh, Tatiana, uh, what were we doing on the ground in Beirut is I was lucky to be a part of a group called uh, Together for Lebanon, and it was a post-relief disaster, you know, unit. It was completely independent and non-affiliated with any, you know, organization or establishment. And we started fundraising and our goal was around 10,000 euros. And we've already reached, I think, almost $80,000. We've almost helped renovate 150 households so far. Our goal is 200 plus. We've also uh, collaborated with the Howard Karagozian Medical Cooperation for medical assistance with LAU for medical assistance. And we've been offering medical, financial, and uh, food supplies to all those who are most affected by the Beirut blast. Thank you. Thanks, Shahin. Mike, what about yourself? Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for, for this wonderful opportunity, and thank you all for being here. So um, just after the explosion, two days after the explosion, um, uh, we as Astarte, um, the NGO I, I co-founded, received a call from uh, other NGOs asking us to help uh, with the mental health uh, issue um, here in Lebanon. So with the help of another Lebanese NGO who gave us a space in, in an area in Ashrafiyeh, 
uh, we um, started and we're managing um, a center for psychological first aid and psychological support for survivors of uh, the blast. So basically that's what I've been doing nonstop for a month. Um, stop completely everything else and just focusing on that for now. Um, there you go. Thank you. And, and Shushan, what about yourself? Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's an honor for me to be part of the panel and thank you to the Armenian Institute for putting it together. Um, after the Beirut explosion, there was this outpouring of support and various people started to offer their services and offers for free. Um, that's architects, designers, mental health practitioners, um, healthcare providers, everyone. Um, but there was a need to centralize this information and make it more easily accessible. And so to respond to this need, I created the Beirut Recovery Resource Guide, which is a database which now contains over 250 services and offers across 10 sectors. And it expanded as well to include the directory of donations, which includes material and financial donations, as well as fundraisers. Um, so the point of this uh, guide was to increase the agency of the affected population by allowing allowing them to choose whatever type of help they needed and to reach out directly themselves. And it's currently available in both Arabic and English, and we are working on a print version, a printed booklet of the website to be distributed to those who might not have interest, internet access. Thank you, thank you. Um, I, Mike, you know, when we, when we spoke, um, when we were talking initially, you'd mentioned um, that you found this idea, uh, when I read, you know, when we read to you the title of our, um, of the synopsis of the event, you found the, the romanticizing of Lebanon tiresome. Can you please elaborate on that? Well, the thing is, uh, I've been through a lot um, being born in the 70s, in the mid 70s, so, I basically lived through the whole civil war and everything that has happened since. And uh, we keep hearing we will rise again, we will rise again, you know, the Phoenix and Beirut and all of that. And it just, we get to a point where this has been going on for almost 40 years. And I think I've had more than 40 years actually. And I think I've had enough of hearing this, oh Beirut, oh Beirut, the beautiful, we were rising and everything. And like I said, at this point, with, with the negligence and what it has done to, to, to Beirut and the country, um, yes, we want to rise, but not in a romantic way. I think we should rise in a very extremely angry way. I think we need to be angry. I think we need to... to start this rom romantic notion of, uh, you know, uh, uh, we always say we're resilient. We always say, uh, as Lebanese people, we are... Um, uh, we can adapt to anything. I think it's time to stop adapting and start implementing changes like real deep changes. So, and it has to start, in my opinion, with anger. How do the rest of you feel? Sean? I think I speak on behalf of all of the I mean, I could be wrong, but I definitely do agree with Mike because, you know, we have this reputation of being resilient and you know Beirut has been sunk under the water quote unquote for seven, seven times and has risen out for the eighth and they keep comparing was, was this the eighth time that Beirut actually sinks underwater but you know there was this op-ed on the New York Times just a few days after the blast and it says the Lebanese people are tired of being resilient and I couldn't agree more because we are you know most of my, my generation has been abroad, either for studies or for career choices. And we've seen the rights that we could have had snap right from our hands because of incompetence and because of corruption. So it's only fair for us to be angry, right? I don't know. I could be wrong. And the other panel discussion uh, panelists could disagree, but this is my two cents on the issue. So Sarin and Shahin, are, are you both angry as well? I mean, of course, we have, <laughs> of course, we have anger. I mean, um, first of all, we ask ourselves, I mean, this is something that I ask, why am I alive when others are not? Uh, and is my life 
really taken for granted and all of our lives are taken for granted when you know that there was an explosion in the heart of the city where every day we spend uh, we, we we go in and out of the of the of the city using this road that is literally in the center of the city so I take this road every single day to go to work, to go to see friends and family. So it could have happened to any one of us. It could have happened any time. I mean, these explosives were there for six years. And uh, so, of course, we are angry. We have uh, guilt. We have a trauma. We are living uh, like... Uh, dead zombies uh, at the moment uh, of uh, why are we still standing when, when others are not and there is no way to, to go back to po uh, pr before August 4th. We cannot go back to what, uh, what we were living before August 4th. There is no way to go back. To go back to what? Uh, to a life that was not even normal. So these are the questions that I think many of us are, are asking uh, ourselves. So Shishan, you know, all of you have been channeling the, these frustrations into helping others. Um, and you've obviously created something that allows, you know, offers a resource for people to find others to help, um, for, to help each other. What are the ways in which, um, you know, what are the other sort of ways in which um, you can have a short or long-term impact in, in sort of supporting the community at the moment? Well, definitely working on the ground is what most people rush to. So whether that's distributing food boxes, actually helping remove rubble, helping people reconstruct their houses, put their doors back into their frames. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done on the ground. Needs assessments are very crucial at the moment. Um, there's so many ways that people can give back. And it's really, it's, re it's really, it's heartwarming to see that so many people actually have um, have been doing their best to give back to their communities in any capacity they can, whether it's through raising awareness on social media, especially for diaspora communities, or people who have been on the ground every day, or people who are artists who, have, who are trying to create uh, pieces of art based on this event. Everyone is trying to do whatever they can. Um, and there's this air of solidarity that was also very heartwarming to see. There isn't any um, competition or negativity among initiatives on the ground. They're all collaborating and everyone is trying to help each other and build their capacity and maximize their impact. And um, that's the situation on the ground, which is, um, um, it's the only thing right now that uh, can spark some hope in us, uh, or at least in me. I mean, Mike and, and Jeanne, you both so eloquently talk about this, you know, this anger that you feel and this, this determination for change so what what kind of impact um can you know could be or what kind of help is needed to change this is it from a governmental level is that all is is that a hopeless situation is it just by sort of helping people on the ground do you have other suggestions of things that can happen right now to help the community um well, let's see. It's it's a complicated issue. There is no denial that uh, the government is definitely not going to do anything because uh, I, I mean I hate talking politics, but it's obvious they don't want any change, any kind of change. So it's back to the people. So the people need to reclaim what is theirs. A government that actually represents that the people's interest. That's for one. And as for me, as, as a therapist and as an educator, what I do basically is just remind my students, be it at school or at university, of the rights of what they should expect uh, from themselves and from the government of what a country is supposed to be, what citizenship is. And as a therapist, just help people um, the best way I can. That's why uh, I started... Uh, I co-founded the NGO. The NGO is about uh, community uh, work and social change. It's not just, it's not about individual therapies. It's about how we can come together as a, as a community and, and see what we need as a community, uh, uh, what can be done and how to implement the changes we need. So it's like um, microscopic changes, but they can, that can add up. And, um, 
in another way, the, the biggest, I think, in my opinion, the biggest problem we have in Lebanon is that history is not taught. There is no history books. It, history uh, in school stops at uh, the Lebanese independence in 1943, and there's nothing after that. So there's a lot of work to be done. Sean, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, nothing major, actually. Uh, it's obvious, it's pretty known uh, that the government really doesn't do much to help. And if they do, it's usually for PR and, and you know, social media. But uh, that's because this country is based on clientelism, you know. So it's those who are in the lower class, those who are actually poor, are also, I don't know if that's a coincidence, I know it's not, they're also people who do not usually belong to any political parties or do not associate themselves with it. So usually the middle class and up are almost always, maybe I, I may be generalizing, but 70% of the middle class and up are part of political system, of part of the political system themselves. So you can't expect a government to help the people as an entity when it has political parties separately helping the people and those who usually make you know, the angry sound are silenced through political parties. So those are left, those who are left who cannot speak are the ones in the lower class who are the most vulnerable in this case. So. Thank you. Um, I mean, I, I, I think th this might lead on to, a, to an, a good question around Shushan and Shine, specifically both of you, because um, what you went on to do straight after the explosion um, is, is quite extraordinary, considering the fact that you had no structure or, or organizational support. Uh, can you talk a little bit about how this came about? And, and you know, I, I won't ask whether you've had any sort of support or um, communication by government, but what about businesses and other charities? Have they, been out, have they reached out to support you or um, have you guys reached out to them? Uh, t talk us a little bit uh, more about how you went about setting this all up and, and the support network that you've created on the back of it. Um, so maybe I can speak on behalf of uh, Together for Armenia, the, you know, the initiative that we started. And definitely charities did help us. Uh, as I was mentioning, uh, Karagozian, the medical center uh, in Beirut helped us with medical supply. The Lebanese American University helped us with medical services. Um, uh, the Sw a Swiss NGO called Blood for Memory helped us with financial donations. Uh, Foundation Armenia, also uh, founded in Switzerland, helped us with financial donations. So, uh, you know, in the most blast situation, I think people moved beyond the political inclinations that the people had. So when you're on the streets, when you're on, you know, trying to clean the rubble, nobody was asking anymore. I think even those affiliated, even those who are not, were not asking anymore because, you know, there comes a point where humanity over, overtakes your whatever affiliation that you have and you don't ask anyone. You don't care what they're a part of. You don't care what they believe in. It's all about, you know, save an extra soul. So that's, what I think, but I could also be wrong, so. Shushan, what about you? Tell us a little bit about the backstory. Um, so I'm fresh out of my master's degree. I only graduated in January. So when the Beirut explosion happened, I was I was driven to implement everything that I had learned in my program. And uh, sort of, I started with a Google Sheet. So it was just a document on Google Drive that I posted in my profile and I got people to share it. And then uh, different NGOs started reaching out to, to me personally because it was on my personal account in the beginning. And they were telling me that this is actually a very necessary thing to have and they were asking to be included in the guide. And eventually as it grew, a friend um, reached out and offered to create a website. And then another friend reached out and offered to help with the branding. So it's been this individual effort. Um, if we were organized, we probably, if there was an organization behind this, it probably would have grown much quicker. But um, I think what we've managed to accomplish so far is uh, good enough because we have helped. We've been receiving very positive feedback so far. 
um, especially with the print booklet. Uh, there's printing agencies offering to help us for free. The design agency helped uh, for free again. Um, so it's definitely been a collaborative effort, a bit ad hoc, but uh, given the circumstances, um, we did what we could. And, 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 and listening to all of you, I, I get the sense that, you know, what's happened is that there's a, there's, a, there's a level of solidarity and it's breaking down, it's tearing down a lot of the barriers that have existed, um, you know, in the past when Shai and you talk about the sort of uh, political party affiliations and so on. Uh, Sadin, um, I know you'd mentioned that you'd done some assessment work with the AGBU. So um, what are your thoughts on that? And, and, and what is the sort of on the ground work that you see right now that is needed? Um, and what, is the, what, what do you think of the immediate aid needs? I mean, this is a very good uh, question. Uh, following the explosion, so we went with AGBU and uh, other organizations to do an assessment of the area and to look at the families uh, who needed support. I mean, a lot of people that we have met were already living in very difficult situations because as you know, Lebanon in the last, since October 2019 has been going on through an uprising or a protest followed by a financial crisis and the Lebanese uh, pound to the dollars. I mean, we lost the value of 80% of our currency. Uh, then the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and, uh, and uh, as well as people losing their jobs. So the area and the whole country has been going on for a huge crisis, uh, humanitarian, financial, and even uh, a whole, uh, the whole livelihood of the country. So um, following the explosion, yes, we went on the ground to assess the, uh, the need, the immediate need. I mean, people needed their uh, houses to be fixed. Uh, needed food, medical supplies. So we worked a lot and we created with other organizations coalitions. And this was very good that many organizations were uh, active on the ground immediately uh, and responding to a crisis that we have not uh, had in our past. So uh, uh, people supporting with food, supporting with medical supplies, supporting with any, any, and the diaspora as well from outside supporting. So um, we also did a working paper with a, with the uh, Zovigan partnership of, a co of what, how the aid should be channeled through a uh, vetting process to the organizations. People don't want to give money to the government. We have lost uh, the trust. We were literally alone on the ground. I mean, following even the explosion, there was no uh, officials on the ground helping with the houses or even giving food or any supplies or even asking families if they were okay or alive and still uh, had some, uh, you know, to, to feel that your life is important and to feel uh, dignified as a human being. So we were completely alone. We were left alone. And many of our families had to uh, rebuild their, their houses uh, up until to date so how will the uh, how will the aid be channeled i mean there are already many organizations who are going through a vetting process of knowing uh, who the, who to help and how to help these uh, these uh, organizations and to make sure that the money is actually arriving to the right people uh, you know the people who need the, these uh, these uh, these funds yeah I mean, I, you know, there's been a huge um, surge in support from the diaspora community, the Lebanese diaspora community. And I think also uh, people that, um, you know, have visited Lebanon and love it in one way or another. Um, and what I, you know, we, we briefly talked about this all together before this, um, before this session. Um, and Mike, you had said something to me, which I found quite interesting. You said that um, the, those who can affect most change are no longer in the country. I mean, do you really believe that that's true? And I'll, and I'll ask the others if they agree with you on that. But more importantly, how do you lure them back? Um, Shushan, do you want to do you want to answer that? Although you are in Armenia, so um, I don't know if that's if it's fair to ask you. Maybe I'll, I'll go with Shahin first, actually. Do you agree with Mike? Yeah, I mean, um, let's just say that uh, ever since 2006, um, there has been a lot of people leaving the country, a lot of them. 
and it has been non-stop. If, I, if I'm going to speak um, on behalf of myself, only I only have one friend left here in Lebanon. She's probably watching now. And that's it. Uh, I have no more cousins, Armenian or not. Um, so you can see that uh, all those who can leave have left. There has been a wave of people coming back uh, in the past couple of years. Um, but um, now it's back again to uh, people just leaving. I mean, people are posting on social media. Uh, you see on Twitter, on Facebook and Instagram, I got my visa, I got my visa. Everyone just wants to leave. And a lot of people who were thinking of coming back do not want to come back again. And we are talking about highly educated people. We are talking about people who can actually either because of their social status or because of their education or, or whatever, who can actually uh, um, do something smart to help uh, implement changes here. So that's what I'm seeing. Call me pessimistic, but that is what I'm seeing um, all around me, sadly. How to lure them back. The thing is, people started coming back because there were hints of change. Um, after the garbage crisis in 2015, there were hints of there being a civil society uh, uh, getting together. And I think this is what prompted some people to come. Um, I may be mistaken. But until they see a change happening, I don't think anyone would want to come back. Shahan, do you agree? Oh, do I agree? Uh, I spent my night yesterday saying goodbye to a friend and I'll spend the night tomorrow saying goodbye to another. So I definitely do it. Um, but uh, there's one thing that I maybe has, a, I have a different perspective than Mike because we are a part of different generations. The only difference is Mike's generation gave Lebanon a chance. My generation is not willing to give Lebanon that chance. And that's what's saddening me the most because my generation saw their parents and grandparents take the chance and stayed in Lebanon. And they saw that that was a mistake. So they are not willing to stay. And even though, you know, the October revolution that took place in almost a year ago now, that gave everyone a little bit of hope. But then when you realize that nothing is bound to change as long as the system doesn't change. And the system doesn't change as long as the people don't change their views and their perspectives, then you become hopeless and it's all natural. I mean, you don't blame them. So you, you, you know, you leave because you don't really, you, you know you have potential and that potential will not get anywhere in Lebanon. So you leave, so you fulfill your potential. So, I mean, would you, so would you say that the diaspora are helping in a meaningful way? I mean, moving away from the current aid efforts, um, what about last year's protests? Um, you know, you've said, I'll, I'll put this back to you, Sharon, you said you found it annoying that they chime in about what needs to happen in the country. And, and, and I think this is true for a lot of diaspora communities globally. I, even Armenia suffers the same um, uh, ailment as well. You know, the diaspora always sort of thinks we know better than Armenia's government about how to run the country. Um, and, and you talked about this, this sort of issue. So, you know, are, are they helping in a meaningful way beyond what's going on right now? Do you feel that they have? Um, of course, of course, definitely. Uh, you know, they have different circles in this, they have different peer groups, different community, they're in different communities and only raising awareness itself is a huge, is, is a huge hand because uh, only from my own circle that are, you know, non-Armenian and non lebanese they financially assisted, they, uh, you know, spread the word around in their circles and et cetera. But the chiming in, yeah, um, especially those diaspora members who left, you know, around five to 10 years ago in, you know, my age, ra age range when they say, you know, for example, two days after the blast, when you're you don't even know what's going on and someone tells you why are you at home you know why are you not cleaning the rubble and you don't expect them to understand the situation that goes on on the ground here in lebanon but you also expect them to understand or maybe at least respect uh the point of view that is maybe hard for them to grasp when they're not, when they haven't been experiencing you know state level corruption for the past decade 
So. Shushan, what, what do you think? Um, well, I think that raising awareness and the advocacy role that the diaspora has been playing, even starting with the October Revolution or protests or whatever you want to call it, um, it's a really important role that diaspora has been playing, not just in Lebanon, but this is seen in most diaspora communities around the world. But um, yeah, I think it's quite important. I mean, all my friends uh, abroad, everyone knew that there was a protest movement in Lebanon. Everyone knew what was going on, what triggered it. There was some misinformation, but um, I think that's an important role that uh, we shouldn't underestimate. So I'll follow up with another question. You currently um, are working for the Armenian Foreign Ministry. Um, why did you choose Armenia and not Lebanon? Um, and did Armenia's Velvet Revolution in 2018 inspire you to move there? Would you be enticed to move back to Lebanon if the country underwent a real government transformation? Yeah, so actually when Mike was talking earlier and he mentioned that there needs to be change for those people that left to come back, I completely agree. And actually one of the reasons that made me want to go to Armenia was the Velvet Revolution that happened two years ago. And we saw this real transformational shift in the country and we saw that there's actually potential and that you can't contribute to building this country. Um, and I think that's one of the main things that drew me to Armenia. But I would say it wasn't a matter of choice. I mean, it wasn't that I had I could choose between working in the Armenian Ministry of Foreign Affairs or the Lebanese one. Uh, the Lebanese one is riddled with nepotism and uh, corruption. And whether and compared to this, the Armenian Foreign Ministry, the process was straightforward. It's more transparent. And um, I would definitely consider going back and building my country, Lebanon, as well, if there's this kind of transformational shift that we saw in Armenia, definitely. So in our earlier discussions, um, all of you initially felt that the sectarian uh, political system was failing. Um, but also listening to you now speak, um, you know, it, it's, it's ultimately the people. Um, it's to the people representing the government. Um, it's the population that enables the government to do what they do. Um, do you think that the, the, the system itself, though, is enabling those that enter politics to remain in their seats for as long as they do? Sarin, I'll, I'll let you start. Uh, also to go back to what you were saying, I mean, in the first uh, part of October, we felt there was uh, a lot of hope with the uh, protest movements. And this hope uh, got faded away uh, throughout the year 2020. So we, we lost a lot of, we lost hope, but yet, um, we always ask ourselves about our identity. I mean, we celebrated, if we can say this year, the 100th uh, anniversary of, the, of, of Lebanon. But uh, what is the identity that we have and what type of hope do we really want to, to continue? So really the change has to be done within, within the country itself. Of course, the diaspora outside plays a, a big role in supporting us. And we are very lucky to have a huge diaspora outside of Lebanon. And this reinforces us to know. But how can we bring back uh, young talents uh, to the country if we don't change this, the whole system, uh, the, the political system that we are living in, when it's not based on clientelism and nepotism that uh, was mentioned before. So it's uh, accountability is key. And this is something that we, we lack in, in, in Lebanon. We don't have proper accountability system where the person is, uh, you're all the time you feel that you're a victim of the, of the, of the system, of the corrupted system. So I would argue then that the sectarian political system is to blame as well, but there is also a fear. There's a fear that if you change the actual system that it will cause more conflict um, than peace. What, what are your thoughts on that, Mike? The thing is, this is, this is the main problem, I think. Um, when Shahen said, your generation, my generation, he was completely right. The problem is, uh, the, only, uh, the, re the people who can actually implement the change and do something are the young generation, because supposedly with the internet or, or whatever, they're a bit more aware of what's happening, whereas people... Uh, my generation and older, looking at my parents, they are, as you said, completely scared of the change of the system being changed. 
and that is a fact. If you tell them, oh, we want, uh, you know, we don't want a sectarian system anymore, they'd go like, and so what happens? What will happen to the Christians? What will happen to the Armenians? What will happen to this and that? So they are afraid of a system because they've been told that the country will collapse without the current system. And they actually don't know what a good alternative is. They, they have never heard of it. And even if they did, it's been uh, uh, turned into this big bad wolf. Like if any other system is implemented, people are going to be marginalized or, or stepped over or, or whatever. Uh, people don't actually know that a non-sectarian system is, can actually be a very good thing where everyone is represented. And, but you have, to go to, you have to go dig deep to get them to forget that their identity is actually, in the case of Lebanon, is actually Lebanese before it is Christian or Muslim or Druze or, 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 or you, you know, all of that. So it's, it's such a deep-rooted uh, issue that, in my opinion, the only people who can actually get, make that change happen are the young generation who are actually leaving. So, so, Mike, back to you then. I'm, I'm going to ask you a question. Um, and this is the thing that, um, do you, when you, when you, how do you identify yourself? Do you identify yourself as Lebanese Armenian, Lebanese Armenian living in Lebanon? Um, do you think it matters? It matters to me. Um, um, I've always, I've always uh, uh, considered myself uh, Lebanese and Armenian, both equally. And uh, I was, uh, I take pride in actually, uh, as soon as I found out we can actually get an Armenian passport, I applied for one way back in 2003, uh, as soon as I was um, in my mid-20s. So I've always felt I was equally both, no question about that. But I was born and raised here, so um, that's why I'm here. I mean, I guess, uh, I think I was born here for a reason. I don't know. But um, if, it, if I had to leave uh, Lebanon, I think the only other country, in my opinion, would be Armenia, because these are my identities. Shahin, what about you as, as, the, as the younger generation, so to speak? <laughs> Um, I think uh, in the 21st in the 21st century, identity the concept of identity is a bit fluid. So you can be, you know, a complete Arab and choose to identify as Armenian, and you're suddenly I Armenian by choice, and you're viral on Armenian Facebook. People celebrate that, right? Mm -hmm. But um, so I don't think I'm Lebanese or Armenian. I'm both and neither at the same time. Uh, it's hard to explain. Maybe, maybe it's a mixture of both. Maybe it's a fusion, but it's fluid. Sometimes, like once Shushan was mentioning, in some groups I'm more Armenian, in some groups I'm more Lebanese. Sometimes I'm Arab. Sometimes I'm Caucasian. I don't know. It all depends, right? It depends on who you're talking to, what you should be, what you want to be, where do you belong. So I think it always depends on the situation, on the circle. Sadin and Shushan, do you want to add anything to that? I mean, it's an identity on its own. Being Lebanese Armenian is who you are. I mean, we were born here, we grew up here, we belong to this country. It's, uh, it is part of who you, of who you are, and it will remain in your uh, in your blood. This is, uh, and uh, this is where home is. I mean. It's part of who you are. It's 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 a combination of both, so you cannot separate them from one another. So I think you know, Mike. You, you, you when you talk about you know that they don't know any better, and, and and it's the fear that sort of paralyzes people to sort of not want to change that system because clearly everybody's you know very has these sort of especially the younger generation they have these sort of different views of identity anyway. So it's not this isn't the challenge. So I'm going to ask you all very briefly um, to, to tell me, if you were given authority to transform the nation, what would you do? So, you know, if you had a hundred days, your first hundred days in office, what would it look like? Um, Shushan, I'll start with you and then Sarin, um, Mike, and then um, Shahin. 
Uh, well, first things first, I would assemble a top-notch team because individually you can't do much even if you're prime minister. Um, so it's really crucial. My first point of action would be to get a team of professionals and not only in, par in the cabinet, which I'm assuming uh, is my position, um, it needs to be from all uh, agencies in the government. So having one state agency that works isn't enough in this situation. I think you would need an overhaul of the entire state system, new professionals being uh, incorporated so that you can then work on um, achieving something tangible so yeah my first thing would be to draw to draw back everyone that has left lebanon to bring them back to bring all those experts and young people back to assemble a team Sarin? i mean uh, first of all you have to bring back uh, trust in in the people and make them feel that you care uh, for the people of this country and uh, not just Lebanese, all residents uh, on our territory here. So uh, to feel that they belong to, to a country that respects and cares for its people. So yes, bring back the talents and bring back whoever wants to rebuild uh, this uh, nation. Mike? Uh, well, well, actually, I do know where to start. So first of all, get the right people for the right job. <laughs> this is something we don't have here. Uh, work on socioeconomic reforms because that is very important. And the most important subject to me would be education, 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 history and citizenship. These are things we lack. And in my opinion, they're, they're the, 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 um, the building blocks of, of a good working system or society. Thank you. To, to build up on the rest of the panelists, I'd say transparency. I think uh, it, it comes before everything that was mentioned because you could have a base of professionals, but also be, you know, corrupt professionals or corrupt experts. So corruption is always, you know, it, it, it's always a factor. It's always a given in Lebanon. So when you take out the corruption, it starts healing itself and we need the transparency to heal with or without the professionals, but of course, preferably with the professionals and experts. So do you, so then do you believe that the, the corruption is not culturally embedded? It's, 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 it's a learned practice. I think it's both actually. I think it's both because we're both born into it and we're also trained and nurtured into it. So it's both, you know, nurture and nature because it's, it's been on for the past 30 or so years. And, uh, you know, you're, you always hear the same sentence over and over again. If you don't, you know, there's the term wasta. Everyone knows what wasta means. It means connections in Arabic, sort of. And if you don't have wasta, then you probably won't make it, you won't make it far in Lebanon. You probably won't make it big in Lebanon. Uh, so this is what we eat all the time. So you're, bound to believe it as well even if you're not part of the system or if you are you always know that if you don't have someone backing you up if you don't know someone who knows someone who knows someone then you probably won't get anywhere yeah i mean um, unfortunately this is um this is not unique to, um, to lebanon either but it's it's i think more heightened in places like lebanon and and, and i think you know if you if you kind of bring us back to reality um, and you look at the situation today. So, you know, you, you talked about transparency um, and we can talk about trust here. Um, you know, when I, when, I, when I hear you all, I kind of get the sense that all that trust is gone. So how do you rebuild it? Um, the protests offered a glimmer of hope, but that hasn't materialized. How do you manage that realization? And, you know, you're all in your own ways affecting change within your own circle of influence. Do you think that this method can ultimately have a wider macro change effect? Sarin, what do you think? Definitely the trust is, is gone for sure. And uh, the accountability needs to be reset in these, uh, I mean, this is rebuilding a whole nation. 
of uh, of people be becoming accountable uh, for uh, their actions um, and and to go back to what would you do in 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 100 days i think you it's, it's something that goes back to like change the whole system of uh, um, that we call it or bribery you have to bribe someone to get uh, materials into the country you have to bribe someone to get a certain paper done why is this uh, so institutionalized in our in our society we need to break this uh, system and have a system of you know checks and balances transparency uh, bring people who are uh, capable into the ground and give them authority to do so thank you and i actually you've you i'm going to ask a bit of a difficult question for you shishan you don't have to respond if you don't want to but um you know you've very, you've all alluded to this sort of connections and, and so on has there been a point in your own in your own life where you know you've been faced with this conundrum of um through a connection i could get some x y or z and how have you dealt with that <laughs> it's a very good question i think at some point or another all of us have faced that conundrum everyone in lebanon um, personally my choice was to build my career based on my merits and my accomplishments rather than any connections um, which is why sort of i chose to get started in armenia rather than in lebanon Uh, to be completely honest to you i mean um yeah but it's really difficult not to get disillusioned in lebanon and um it's it makes you take really difficult decisions being lebanese forces you to take these really difficult decisions that other people live their entire lives without facing so that's my two cents on it and, and do you feel that what you're doing right now could have a have a wider impact on um on the change that is needed. Uh, what I'm doing right now is in the Beirut Recovery Guide. Yeah. Uh, well, it's the first initiative of its kind and uh, I'm hoping that it can have a wider impact because the recovery process won't end in a month or two months or two three months. It's going to take years. Um, and I'm hoping to build this initiative further and uh, support the process from its beginning which we did and to the end hopefully when we see Beirut rebuilt. Um, so yeah, I, I am hopeful in that. And, and my concern: Have your ethics um, ever come into um, into question? You know, based on um, the sort of the, the sort of system that you live in. Well, uh, you're sometimes unwillingly you're faced with um, with that kind of decision, as in you. It's not a choice you have. Um, I've managed so far to limit, um, I, I can't even think of uh, um, any time where I had to use my connections. It's always been on my merits, except for um, recently. I actually had to, but it was for the greater good, as they say. And it it, it wasn't like I was taking anyone's place or... or uh, um, hurting anyone it was just a way to get things moving forward for everyone's sake so it was all positive that's about the only uh, um time i i say i i used some sort of connection um yeah i just want to add something um uh, because we we're talking about change uh, um, you have to understand if we want to uh, um we're talking about hope and change and all of that if you want to imp- there's no miracle cure change and and getting the country to a better place is not going to happen overnight and it's not going to happen over 10 or 20 or 30 years there's something ingrained in the in the lebanese mentality and in their dna about uh, um the subjects we talked about about being always having to have a leader uh, a public figure that you follow blindly or or the system of of uh, um corruption or nepotism or that it's so ingrained that uh it would i have a feeling it will the change will not come from the people it will come from a government that is actually going to be transparent or that is going to abolish all of that and then people will get used to the new system and little by little all the traces of of the old system will be out of their uh, bodies um and i'm talking not just mentally i'm talking about dna as well 
I, th I think I think you raise a very good point um, because it is it is really it, it, you do need you do the government does play a, a fundamental role in transforming society as well. It's not just society that can do that on its own. It's not civil society. Um, and I and I want to talk um, a little bit about the sort of uh, collective trauma that you, Sarin's alluded to. You've talked about, Mike. You, you've um, you know how it's affecting um, your generation. And I'm gonna, um, Sean, I'm gonna lumber you all into one generation. Um, I hope you don't mind. Um, but those of your parents as well. Um, and how do you come and sort of walk, come out of the cyclic mental state and existential guilt that you all feel, or some of you feel? I mean, Sarin, you talked about um, about it. Mike, you talk about you know education being fundamental to this. Um, what? I mean, how do you think that this is affecting um, society? And, and is it um, sort of incapacitating you all and paralyzing you into, into inaction? Um, Shahin, do you want to kick off? Uh, yeah, for sure. I mean, um, you know, I would say, of course, unfortunately, my parents' generation is dealing with this much better than we are. Uh, than my dead generation is because they've lived through this. They've lived through this for 15 years. They know these sounds. They're too familiar with destruction, which is completely sad. It's devastating. It's depressing. And uh, it's, it's unfortunately the case, but for, you know, uh, the, the generation that was born in the past 25 years, we haven't really experienced anything. Like, you know, we've experienced assassinations and explosions and whatnot, yes but nothing of the scale. Yeah, I know, I mean, Shushan is laughing, but it is the truth. We have experienced, you know, things that could mean uh, everlasting trauma for the West were, you know, things that we took for granted here, you know, whether it be at war with the any state, quote unquote, or, you know, ass assassination attempts, but this one was different. This one affected everyone in our circle, be it material, uh, or collateral, or even uh, human injury or death. So it was beyond just shaky noise. It was uh, something that affected our communities, our friends, our families. So I don't think anyone could outlive this experience. Maybe I'm lucky enough that I was just right outside of Beirut and not in the center. Some, I think Shushan was. Uh, I don't know about Sadin or Mike, but um, I don't think anyone not Lebanese people, of course, but anyone in the world deserves to go through this. And I don't think Lebanon in general deserves to go this. So I understand everyone who, who wishes to move and leave. Okay. Thank you. Sarin, what about you? Uh, I mean, there is life before August 4th and after August 4th. And what we have lived uh, that day is very, it's, I mean, even when we hear an airplane or a truck passing by next to our house or, there, or a noise when we're walking uh, on the streets, we are, our whole body shaken. So it's, it's really going to leave uh, an impact. I mean, uh, just to, to, to share with you a story of a woman I've met actually, and who's, uh, who, who left, uh, escaped Syria to live in, in Beirut. Her son got injured from the, uh, from the explosion. And uh, her son, the second day told her, mama, are we going to live? Why did you bring us to Lebanon? Are we going to see another war? I mean, this is something that is part of our lives. And we don't want to, to see this, uh, to live this war trauma ever, again and again. And we lived it with our parents. How many times can we rebuild uh, our houses? Our, our mental well-being has been uh, uh, affected. And not just, uh, an, an entire society has been affected by this explosion. And it's really hard to go back to uh, um, to or to, to go back to being normal I don't know how we are still working we're still going to work we're still uh, every day living uh, seeing our family and friends when we had we have seen this uh, 
uh, through our own eyes. And um, I mean, the amount of mental health support that we see on the ground, there are actually clinics, uh, free clinics being offered to, uh, to uh, all age groups. And there are so many organizations who have created mental health uh, support, whether it's a therapist or, uh, I mean, Mike knows about it, and whether it's a, um, a psychologist or, or social workers turning into helping uh, one another even i mean just to give you a few examples of an ngo we were talking uh, to even the workers themselves the psychologists the social workers are going on sick leave because they are themselves tired of hearing the cases and because they are living this uh, this trauma so it will take a whole <laughs> I mean, how, how can we cannot go? We cannot forget. We will never forget what happened to us. Uh, and uh, I think even kids, young children who live this, uh, two, three, four years old, have seen this and will not forget uh, uh, the, the sound and the explosion. And uh, uh, I mean, the sight, even when you walk in uh, throughout Beirut and if you see the silos and the area of the explosion and the demolished houses. You are, uh, you are, you, you cry, you cry when you, 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 you drive every morning in the first three, three weeks when I was going to work, I was asking myself, how can I go back to work? And I started just crying while driving. Uh, and maybe this is my own therapy. And, uh, and, and I, I and talking to friends and colleagues and, and all the time, this is part of, uh, of knowing that we're not alone in this that we've all lived this trauma and not just uh, residents of Beirut that we are, but the whole country and uh, is actually live, going through this. I mean, I, I think um, I, I, fundamentally, I think, you know, you're right. And I, what, one thing I wanted to ask Shushan and Mike about um, before I move on to the, the sort of last question is, is this feeling of insecurity that's been, that's, um, I guess has manifested itself from this, this, um, this state of, um, I guess, um, trauma that, that, you know, has sort of um, befallen everybody. Do you find that it's affecting you on a personal level, um, you know, and, and in, your, in your own personal relationships? Shushan and, and, and um, Mike, actually, I don't know if you want to sort of share some, um, something about this. Um, I can share from the perspective of being abroad, like one foot is always in Lebanon, one foot is wherever I am. And I'm hesitant internally to settle down anywhere because I know that my friends are in Lebanon, my family, my home, everything is in Lebanon. So even though I've left Lebanon internally, I'm still so attached to everything that's going on. And the trauma, you carry it with you wherever you go. Leaving Lebanon doesn't really help you with everything Sarin described earlier. I mean, I still get the flashbacks of the explosion. I was quite close to it at the time. Um, yeah, that it's this feeling of being hesitant, of settling, and, and this feeling of being feeling guilty of being abroad and getting this fresh start, whereas everyone else doesn't have this opportunity, maybe. It's quite a burden to carry. Mike, what about you? Um, of course, of course. Of course, we're affected, and of course, we're personally affected. I can tell you that I haven't been to the anywhere near uh, the 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 streets and the neighborhoods that were affected, except for Karim Zaitun, where the center is. That's the only place I go because I've been there before. I've been through a similar destruction during the civil war uh, in '89 and '90. I actually posted a video of, I actually have a video of how my area was completely destroyed and I posted it online on, on YouTube. And I just didn't want to go through that again. I, I, I was like, no, I'm, I'm not going to go help clean up. I'm not going to go see. I did that when I was 13 or 14. Uh, we cleaned up the whole area and I'm like, I can't, I can't, couldn't do it again. So I'm like, okay, I can help people with mental health and that's what I'm doing. Um, but I definitely don't want to go there. Not just yet. I don't know when I'll be able to. So we am I affected? Of course, I'm tremendously affected. I I, I can speak of my, for myself. I haven't been able to sleep properly. It was only a week ago that I started having more than five hours of sleep at night. Um, 
nightmares and all of that. And and I wasn't uh, anywhere near the, the explosion when it happened. I was away in the mountains. I heard it faintly, but um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I don't even begin, can't even start telling you how affected <laughs> I am. And so I don't know about people over there. I mean, and how do you get over that? Um, you don't. I don't think you do. You never do. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Thank you. I, 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 I want to kind of go back to what, um, you know, the, the, the session synopsis. A home so important, but it must be rebuilt, must be reshaped, must be fixed, whatever the costs. Um, these are not questions, but conflicting ideas held by many people, often simultaneously by each individual. When you think about these conflicting thoughts and your own um, decisive actions to help the, the country, do you feel you're rebuilding a sustainable future or adding again because the real change will never materialize? Very briefly, um, if each of you could uh, sort of share a few thoughts on that. Sean, do you... I, I... Oh, sorry, Mike, go ahead. Um, sorry. So um, I actually don't want to. I don't want to think if it's going to be worth it or not. I because to to think of that might actually uh, um, take me, bring me, you know, take me back or or, or uh, I don't know, I don't know what I'm saying anymore. Just uh, take me to places where I don't want to go. I'll just I'll just keep on doing what I do. Uh, what I feel I should do, implementing changes and and helping out as much as I can and just hope for the best. I don't want to think if if it's for any good or not. I'll just do what I can do and hope for the best. Shahin? Um, You know, on on a civilian level, I don't know how much rebuilding you can potentially do to fix a country. Um, You can definitely rebuild doors and windows. Yes, for sure. That's material damage. But can you rebuild a state that was, you know, killed by its own negligence? Do you uh, rebuild? Do you want to rebuild a state that killed its own people? Um, I don't know if we want to rebuild unless we're rebuilding unless we're building something. I don't think we want to rebuild what was there before, you know? Nobody wants to go back to normal anymore. Nobody wants to, you know, everyone's saying the same, right? Uh, In in the US, it's like, nobody wants to go back to normal. We want justice. Nobody wants to go back to normal. It's the same case for Lebanon. We don't want to rebuild. We want to build from scratch because rebuilding has shown time and time again that it doesn't work. The last time that, you know, and, Mike's parents are uh, just a sample of so many parents around in Lebanon. The last time these people tried to change the system, they went through, they lived through a 15 year civil war. So it's not simple, but I don't think there is the tendency to rebuild, but maybe there is a tendency to build from scratch a totally different system. I don't know if that's doable. I don't know if that's feasible. I don't know if the people, the mundane lives can do this, but that's what the wishes are. That's what people hope for. Um, yeah, I can just say that sometimes the Lebanese state feels like a hydra whenever you cut off one of its heads to sprout. So it's, it feels really daunting at times trying to combat this constantly. So if I'm completely honest with you, I'm quite hopeless at the moment. And the only, as I mentioned earlier, the only hope I see is that so many young people are driven to work and they are working nonstop and devoting all their time and energy. And um, circling back to something Mike mentioned earlier, he thought he mentioned that it's the state that needs to change. So, but I'm more of a proponent of a bottom up change. So I believe that it's up to the people and especially the young generation. So, um, yeah. Thank you. Sorry. We are, I mean, we are somehow uh, doing small initiatives. That's what uh, the four of us uh, have done through our private organizations, through our volunteering, our time uh, 
to set to rebuild trust at least in the people and uh, to give hope this is what we can do to survive this is our only way to to survive is to to have small initiatives to rebuild uh, the country and, and and i think before we move on to the q and a because i know that there's quite a lot of questions coming through um I, I, I'll ask you and just answer in yes or no. Um, you know, you, you've all talked about being tired. Um, obviously, this has had a massive impact, you know, on you, on your friends, on your families, um, some more than others. Um, you know, Shine, you talked about sort of the younger generation not having really experienced something like this of this magnitude. So, you know, I I see you all and I sort of think that you're all, you've all been galvanized you're taking the initiative um you know within days you know and i and i see this even with the lebanese diaspora my friends um in the uk and, and all the great work that's been going on i was in cyprus at the time and all the great work that was going on there so you, you i mean you're you're not relying on the powers that be to solve the country's challenges so i'd argue hope is not lost shahan um maybe hope in the diaspora is not lost because they didn't quite see what we saw. Um, maybe we're uh, much more hopeless than we should be. Maybe our hopelessness is much greater than, you know, the actual hopelessness that we should have, that we should experience. Um, because, you know, it's not everyday life anymore. It's, it's, burden upon burden upon burden it's it's the economic it's the pandemic it's the political and then there's the blast so i am pessimistic but i'm also realistic when i say i'm hopeless as well um we can maybe you know save the economy for a few more months we can maybe uh rebuild a little here and there but it's it's uh, you know it's systematic it's there's no escape. We either change it or we go down with the Titanic, right? So. Okay, thank you. And Sarin and uh, Mike and um, Shushan, I don't know if you want to sort of briefly answer that. Yes, I mean, we have to build hope. Otherwise, why are we staying in this country? Why are we working here? Why are we still believing in this uh, in this life that we are leading this is why you, we we decided to stay uh, to continue our lives to rebuild and to to have hope has to come back uh, it's our only way of survival otherwise uh, if we lose completely hope we 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 can't even uh, we, we 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 won't be able to exist that's why we have to rebuild uh, from scratch, unfortunately. I'm conscious that there's some questions, there's, there's quite a few questions coming through from, uh, from Facebook as, um, that I'd, I'd like us to address. So there is one from Lara um, Ahorian, Ahorian. Um, apologies for the mispronunciation. Any grassroots movement or civil society mobilization on the ground that has the potential to lead? And if yes, how many, how much how much are the Armenians involved in it? So, so, are, so yeah, are there any grassroots movements or civil society mobilization on the ground that has the potential to lead? So I guess, you know, organizations like um, the Lebanese Red Cross impact Lebanon and how much, uh, how involved are Armenians in that? I don't know if one of you wants to answer that question. Um, yeah, I can speak about some initiatives. There has been a lot of cooperation between different kinds of NGOs. So, for example, there's Base Camp in Mar Mikhail, which has which is a collaboration between different NGOs, and they're trying to meet needs. There's Nation Station in Jamaisi area, Jamaisi more like, um, which has been doing the same. Live Love Beirut has established headquarters. So there's a lot of talent and initiative uh, on the ground, which can be uh, kind of built on to take leadership positions. Um, as for the Armenian involvement, I have to say that it's more of an individual involvement if there is any Armenian involvement. Um, 
certainly there should there are there must be involved armenians but uh, more more or less armenian community has mobilized uh, like together for lebanon for the armenian community mainly i don't know if shahen would like to add something on this but uh, that's my impression of it um yeah i mean together for lebanon is beyond armenians but what i what i was what i wanted to mention is there's a lot of humanitarian uh you know volunteering and organizing and grassroots movements and all of that but when it comes to collectivism nobody's organized and you know when the, during the october revolution it was great and everyone was happy it was the adrenaline rush of the Leban that the lebanese people needed but um in terms of political activism there's no leadership and when there is no leadership i, I mean according to me if there's no leadership in political activism then political goals are very hard to meet are very hard to reach so it's just you know a bunch of people that are mad about what corruption and how do you change that and then there's no answer so the civil movement needs leadership they need clear goals and reform measures if they want to succeed and like shushan said armenian involvement is on an individual level of course um it's where you know a part of the population we're everywhere so no, no matter where you look, you're definitely going to find one Armenian taking part in whatever it is. Uh, but in terms of humanitarian uh, NGOs, uh, nonprofits, we're good at. But political activism, we're inexperienced, uh, so ex inexperienced. And I can't blame them, but we need experience. And I guess people are building up that experience that we need. So there's a question here from Vartan um, Marashulian. How adequate was um, the Armenian government's response to the blast in Beirut and support both to the country of Lebanon and Armenian community there? What was missing from your point of view? Shushan, I don't know whether you have any insight into this um, working for the ministry. Uh, well, I've only just started to work this week, but uh, so, but being there, I know that there has been aid that's being sent. I know that even the Republic of Artsakh sent a lot of aid. Um, but um, one thing I'd like to mention is maybe there was a lot of push towards repatriation that was a bit early, a bit early on, where people were still processing uh, their feelings and their trauma. And there was this huge uh, push to come back to Armenia, we can help you, which was maybe a bit early, um, too early, in my opinion, at least. But um, there has been some initiatives. I can't say whether they're, they're, it's been enough or not. It's not up to me to qualify that. But um, yeah. Does anybody want to add anything to that? I can just, um, so uh, the, the help that has been coming um, towards, uh, um, I don't, I don't think that, as, as everyone said, it's an individual involvement from, from the Armenians. I haven't seen any uh, um, Armenian based uh, um, society or, or NGO or anything working uh, in that name, because I think, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that most uh, uh, um, NGOs or groups or whatever are actually politically affiliated. Um, either politically or religiously affiliated, there's no uh, civil uh, um, associations or whatever, um, which makes their inv the, the involvement of, of the Armenians in any kind of change um, difficult. It has to be individual because there is no uh, um, grouping of, of, you know, because we're Armenian, we're always going to be taken politically. You're a minority, so you have to be affiliated to, to, to a group or else you're going to be working as an individual. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Um, Nuritza, I know that you've got um, a question. Tato, do you mind unmuting? myself is that all right yes. yeah can you hear me yes <laughs> i mean it really is admirable and i i don't know how you do it and more power to you and, and more courage to you 
I wanted to ask firstly, um, to what extent some of the, the phenomena that you describe, the social phenomena um, that you describe also apply to, to the Arab Lebanese, the Lebanese themselves, or do you, do you have solidarity with them or do you see yourselves as quite separate from that group? Uh, from from the general population, I mean, and um, as I was thinking, also it struck me listening to you that this sudden explosion also reminded me of the earthquake in Armenia, and how that created a kind of radical it radicalized the country, and it also radicalized the diaspora, and um, all the sorts of quarters of the diaspora who weren't particularly interested in Armenia suddenly started um, wanting to help arriving there and, and trying to um, affect change. Do you think that there's a possibility of a, of a similar uh, phenomenon happening in the Lebanon? And how does the Lebanese diaspora react politically to the Lebanon? Do I have to specify? Um, I guess I guess I can take this question. Um, in terms of uh, the first question, I, I speak on my own behalf when I say, uh, you know, I am Lebanese and I'm also Armenian. So my Lebanese side is always is friends with the, the Arab Lebanese, of course. And it's, you know, my grandparents are born in Lebanon. My parents are born in Lebanon and I'm born and raised in Lebanon. So of course, there is that sense of, you know, oneness with the country, because mm -hmm. I've only visited Armenia as a tourist. So am I really Armenian? You know, that kind of identity crisis that's created in all diaspora Armenians. But I am Lebanese, and I do identify as Lebanese, and I do feel with the people of Lebanon. And in terms of the earthquake, you know, um, the major difference is it's a natural disaster where people... Uh, you know, don't blame anyone. It's mm. just helping. But in this case, it's also blaming anger, uh, frustration, uh, piled up rage, plus help. So all that and the help that we're receiving is, you know, sometimes it contradicts each other. They contradict each other because um, the diaspora left because they are mad, because they are tired of the government. So when they see that the same government has, you know, due negligence uh, destroyed its own, its own city, they're as equally enraged as they want to help. So sometimes they're like, you know what, I won't be helping you rebuild. You just come over. You just uh, immigrate to the U.S. You just come to Armenia instead because rebuilding in Lebanon, it's hopeless. But that was not the situation in Gumbi. I wonder. Thank you. I'm I really have to agree with Shahan. Absolutely. I, I agree with everything he said. Yeah, totally. It's impossible uh, um, for, for, I mean, <clears throat> if I, it's impossible for Armenians, I think, for Armenians being, uh, living outside to say, okay, we're going to help you uh, in Lebanon yet again when they can see, even if they just look at what has been happening in the past decades, that there's actually no point. There's actually get out of Lebanon, you know, seek better uh, pastures elsewhere. Um, yeah, that's the difference with a natural disaster or the earthquake. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to say that we're running, we're actually running out of time. Um, and uh, we have a hard stop at nine, but I, um, I, I do want to take this moment to thank our panelists um, for such an insightful and I think um, you know, very open discussion um, about how you're feeling and what you're doing and and what you think. I think it's really important to hear that. I, I don't think that, you know, we should be amplifying voices like yours because it's your, it's your voices that can create change. Um, and I want to thank you, all four of you, for participating and for the questions. And I'm sorry that we weren't able to answer all the questions. I, I would like to remind everybody that the um, the... The UK Armenian community is fundraising for Lebanon um, through the um, through its UK Armenian Community Emergency Management Committee network, 
Um, I will share the link with you guys here. If you'd like to donate, um, please do. Um, usually, as you know, we, we sort of donate, um, we ask you to donate to AI, but in lieu of us, please donate to, um, to, the, um, to the fundraiser. Um, we do have a feedback form that I will also share with you. Please send, um, please fill that in and send us back um, any feedback that you have. And, um, a, and just a quick reminder that we have a, um, another um, diaspora discussion coming up on Monday the 14th um, about how today's diasporic Armenian youth renegotiate past traumas relating to notions of homeland. Well, thank you very much, everybody. And um, please do share your feedback with us. Thank you.